Hi, my name is Dr. Peter Kay, and this is the next lecture in this module, um, Fluid Dynamics. And this lecture is called Incompressible Fluid Flow Rate Measurement. Okay, so what we're going to cover in this lecture, I'm just first going to talk a little bit about why um, we want to measure um, flow rate. Um, and I then introduce ways that we can measure it. Um, and these are commercial methods of measuring um, effectively fluid velocity and therefore the flow rate. And they are the Venturi meter, um, sharp edged orifice, um, pitot-static tube. And we're also going to talk about um, open channel flow measurements, which is um, uh, used for um, looking at volume flow rates um, from weirs and that sort of thing. Okay, so why do we want to know um, fluid flow rate? Well, um, for quite a number of reasons. So particularly in engineering processes, we need to know um, what mass fluid flows flow in, um, say, between tanks or um, proportions of chemicals in a um, in a plant, or you know, if you're a water company, how much um, you need to bill your customers dependent on the amount of water that they're using. So there's quite a lot of reasons why um, you need to know the mass flow rate of fluid flow in a pipe. But there are also um, other reasons which might not be so obvious and. You can use um, fluid flow rate measurement to determine the speed of aircrafts and watercrafts because if you know the um, velocity of the fluid relative to the um, craft then you know how fast the aircraft is going for example if you know what the velocity is relative to the air um, the air outside so you can use it for those types of applications as well okay so the first one we're going to cover is the venturi and so here's a schematic of a venturi here and fluid flows going from left to right. And venturi typically is made up of three parts. Um, there's a convergent part, so you can see that the um, it goes from this larger diameter down to this smaller diameter. And the narrowest um, area in the venturi um, is termed the throat. Okay, And then from the throat, um, it diverges in this divergent part back up to the original inlet diameter. And hopefully you can notice um, from the way that it's been drawn that the divergent part here is actually longer than the um, uh, convergent part here. And the reason for that is that when you um, diverge fluid, um, if you do it too aggressively or too abruptly, then um, you'll get eddies that will form and then this will create um, pressure losses in your meter, which obviously means it won't be as effective. You don't have quite the same problem um, conversion. Obviously, you still don't want to um, converge it too aggressively, but it's more of an issue in terms of diverging. That's why um, these sections tend to be longer. And the two equations that we'd be looking at for all of these problems, really, um, to um, measure the mass flow rate through these devices is continuity, which um, is covered in another lecture, and that's conservation of mass. And also Bernoulli's, which I also covered in another lecture, which is conservation of energy. So we'll be using these two in combination to work out the mass flow rate through um, these devices. OK, so let's um, consider this Venturi. OK, and we're considering two planes, one which is the inlet at the inlet diameter and two which is at the throat. Now, if we want, um, want to work out the pressure difference, which you'll see that we need um, later on we need to know this pressure difference to enable to work out the velocity uh, relative velocity between one and two <laughs> so we connect up this manometer and we have a manometer fluid in there and if you remember from when we're doing the hydrostatics um, the pressure a has got to be the same as pressure b okay otherwise this level is going to change so pressure a is equal to the pressure b now the pressure a is equal to the static pressure at one okay and that's this term here plus the hydrostatic pressure of the fluid acting on A. So in this instance, it's uh, rho G of the fluid. So rho is the density of the fluid that's in the pipe, plus um, this distance and this distance. OK, again, that gives us pressure A. Now, the pressure at B is slightly different. So it's the static pressure at 2, which is in the throat, plus the um, rho G times the height Y, remembering that this density is the density of the fluid. But then it's plus um, the density of 
the fluid in the manometer, so that's what that subscript m means, is density of the fluid in the manometer, times gravity times hp. Okay, and um, if we expand the bracket on this side, we can see that these two terms now cancel, and we are re we can rearrange to show that the pressure difference is equal to the um, density of the fluid in the manometer minus density of the fluid in the um, pipe times by gravity times by the head of the manometer. Okay, so in general, um, the equations for pressure difference is this. I'm not going to repeat it, the one that we found on the previous slide. Now, when the fluid in the venturi is a liquid, then the density of the um, liquid in the manometer and the density of the liquid in the pipe are going to be of similar orders of, orders of magnitude. Therefore, we use the... Um, the equation as is. However, if the fluid um, in a manometer is a gas, then the density of the manometer fluid is likely to be much higher than the density of the gas. So if this was water and air, it would be a thousand is much, much greater than 1.2. Therefore, we can neglect this, the hydrostatic pressure from the gas, and this term disappears. So we can just use this if it's a gas in the tube. Okay, so we come back to the that um, pressure difference uh, um, a little bit later on, but now I'm going to show you how we can um, derive the mass flow rate um, through a venturi. So from um, uh, you should remember from the previous lecture that the mass flow rate is equal to the density times the area times the velocity through that area. Okay, and um, we presumably know the density in our of our fluid and we know the area that's flowing through. So what we need to do is we need to find the velocity. And to do that, we're going to use Bernoulli's between two points. So remembering from Bernoulli's that Bernoulli's is a static pressure plus a dynamic pressure plus a potential pressure term is a constant. So um, from one to two, uh, you can write it like this. Now, most um, venturis will be horizontal. Okay, It's not always the case, um, but... Mostly they are, but in, so assume in our instance, in our example it is, so therefore Z1 is equal to Z2, therefore these terms will cancel. Okay, now we're left with this, the static pressure and the dynamic pressure term. And if we rearrange this, because what we're trying to find, remember, is one of the velocities, we can um, write it like this. So C2 squared minus C1 squared is this function of um, delta P. And remember that we, from the previous slide, we um, derived an expression for the change in pressure um, based on the values of the manometer. So we can put this in. However, we've got two unknowns. We we don't know what C2 is or C1 is. So we can't um, yet solve this, If we, even if we knew what the, assuming we know, now know what the delta um, pressure is. So this is where continuity comes into it, because from continuity, for an incompressible reflow, flow, we know what flows in must flow out. Therefore, the area times the velocity at 1 is equal to the area at 2 times the velocity at 2. And if we square both sides, um, we end up with this expression. Then I'm going to rearrange to make C2 um, the subject, or C2 squared, I should say. So now we have an expression for C2 squared. And from the previous slide, we had um, this expression from Bernoulli's. Okay, so we can substitute this equation that we've derived from continuity into Bernoulli's, and we end up with this one. Okay, so now we, um, assuming that we know the areas and the def pressure differential, we can calculate C1, but we just need to rearrange it to make C1 the subject. So this is what we had on the previous slide. So take in C1 squared um, out of the brackets and then divide it all through by that and square root in. We can find out this um, expression for C1. Now it looks quite um, a complicated formula, but um, essentially it's just been distilled down from uh, Bernoulli's and continuity. Okay. So going back to our original um, equation which for the, the for the mass flow rate then the mass flow rate through this venturi is equal to the density times the area one times c1 which we've um, previously um, found on the previous slide okay and if you want to um, you can either work out the areas but normally you'll be given the diameters 
So you can either work out the area from the diameters or just to save yourself a job by remembering that the area is equal to pi d squared over 4, then the pi over 4 would cancel um, in each term. So you can just put in the diameter squared in here, but you've got to remember it's all squared. Okay. Okay, so that shows us how to work out the um, ideal mass flow rate through a venturi meter. However, um, we kind of know um, inherently in reality that what we calculate theoretically is not always actually what we get. So the actual mass flow rate will always be less than theoretical due to friction, pressure losses, etc. And that difference is um, described by the discharge coefficient, CD. And this is defined as the ratio of the actual mass flow rate that you have to the theoretical mass flow rate. So if you had um, a discharge coefficient of 0.9, then what you're saying is you've actually got 90% of your theoretical flow. If you had a discharge of 0.8, it'd be 80% of theoretical flow, and so on. So once you've worked out the, um, uh, the theoretical mass flow rate, like we did on the previous slide from row AC, then to get your actual mass flow rate, you just times this by the discharge um, coefficient. And um, this discharge coefficient is something you'd normally um, read off a table or a chart or from a book. And um, normally there's been numerous experiments for a, a range of venturis and orifice plates and different flow devices. So you would just go and look up um, the um, discharge coefficient for a similar device and then use it in here. And that's normally sufficient accuracy for what we need. And a typical value of discharge coefficient for a venturi is 0 0.98.